the most expensive RX 5700 XT yet has arrived in our office. And today we're exhaustively benchmarking the ASRock RX 5700 XT Tai Chi X to see if it's actually worth the $480 current asking price that we're seeing for it. The Tai Chi X is certainly one of the more ornate Navi cards up there with the Nitro Plus, but its price is in territory of 2070 Supercard and its performance needs to be seriously outdoing the already chart-topping set of 5700 XTs we've looked at. In these benchmarks, we'll look at all the vBIOS options, extensive thermal results, noise and acoustics, and assembly quality of the ASRock Tai Chi X 5700 XT. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake C360 DDC Hard Tubing Water Cooling Kit. If you're ready to dip your toes into the water and build your first open loop cooling system, the Thermaltake C360 DDC hard tubing kit comes with all of the components you need. The kit includes a 360 millimeter radiator, three 120 ARGB fans, a copper W4 ARGB water block for the CPU, a pump and res DDC combo, and all the fittings needed to build a full CPU open loop. Learn more at the link in the description below. The biggest question mark we have right now going into this review is going to be price. So the only listing we found on a US retailer at present has this card, the Tai Chi X, at about $480. There's a $10 mail-in rebate, putting you at $470, big deal. But that's still significantly more expensive than the Nitro Plus, which was already kind of pushing it. In the Nitro Plus review, we basically came to the verdict of, this is a really good card, barring some issues with the auto fan profile, but that's resolvable. Uh, this is a really good card, but your choice is basically by what was then the best of the 5700 XTs that we had tested, but spend more for it, or get a low-end partner model of one of the NVIDIA competing options for maybe 50 bucks more or something like that. You're starting to push up towards 2070 Super Territory. This card, it's an even easier decision because at 480, 470, whatever it is, that price is so high that it's just, it's not even in the same atmosphere as the Nitro Plus. This is a completely different territory. So anyway, we're gonna review it versus the Nitro Plus, the, the Pulse, the Gaming OC, everything else we've tested so far. We're looking really heavily at thermals, see if it can possibly prove value strictly from a performance standpoint. And then the rest of it's gonna be smaller features that are harder to really put a conclusion on like the look, but this doesn't particularly seem like a look that you need to overspend on. So we'll talk about that some in the conclusion as well. The biggest question though is going to be if this card comes down in price as supply increases. And we'll have to just pay attention to that because ideally it's more in the 450, 440 dollar area. But anyway, let's get into the numbers. We'll start with thermals. A quick note, gaming results are basically irrelevant as are overclocking results. Overclocking is going to be limited, not by the PCB, unless it's exceptionally bad, which we haven't looked at yet. It's not going to be limited by the PCB, it's going to be limited by silicon quality. And that doesn't change no matter which card you buy. So there's really no point in diving into that. Uh, the power budget will dictate it the most after that, but more on that later. We'll start with just the ASRock Tai Chi and then add the rest of the 5700 XT partner models. We're doing this because the data rapidly becomes overwhelming otherwise, and we'll shed some of the ASRock results in the comparative chart. For just the ASRock data, we found the old and new vBIOS had no meaningful impacts to thermal results when normalized to 40 dBA. This makes sense, as the GPU power limit hasn't changed either, and vBIOS changes most commonly affects the fan curve. We'll look at those in the auto results section later. Notably, when configuring our 40 dBA fixed fan speed, we noticed that the newer vBIOS treats the PWM to RPM response differently. With the original vBIOS, 47% PWM was enough to achieve 1812 RPM for the fans, whereas the new vBIOS would yield around 1670 RPM at the same 47% PWM, requiring instead a 51% PWM to achieve 1812 RPM, which was our 40 dBA target. This isn't really important in any way other than to illustrate that testing has to be carefully checked and controlled, as our initial set of new vBIOS tests had to be thrown away due to this subtle change. This next chart will shed the old vBIOS results. For this one, we're looking at the comparative data versus other 5700XC models at 40 dBA noise levels, configured as measured at 20 inches away. 
The results are measured at steady state and taken in an ambient environment of 21 degrees Celsius with active ambient monitoring via thermocouple readers to ensure second-to-second -second accuracy. The steady state measurement is averaged over a few hundred rows of data just to give us uh, a firm number and eliminate outliers. Keep in mind that noise normalizing isn't enough anymore, and we also must consider the power budget permitted by the vBIOS. If a card allows more power budget, it'll naturally run hotter, and so we have to keep power and the noise levels is both in mind. The Tai Chi X at 190 watts, or the self-named silent vBIOS, runs at 78.5 degrees Celsius junction when configured to a manual 40 dBA fan speed. This ignores the default vBIOS fan profile in favor of leveling the playing field to determine the cooler efficiency, edge temperature measured at 67 degrees, but junction is much more sensitive and important to boosting headroom. The performance allows the Sapphire Nitro Plus to outperform the Tai Chi X in spite of its extra 10 watts power budget plotting 73.5 degrees for junction. Our modded MSI Evoke is aftermarket and so doesn't count, but the next card behind the Tai Chi X after that is the Nitro Plus at 220 watts. Thus far, the Tai Chi X is able to lay claim to a top performing cooler for the 190 watt to 200 watt vBIOS range, but it's not better than our Nitro Plus model. The Tai Chi X at 230 watts predictably runs about the hottest as it's the vBIOS that allows the most power consumption out of all of the ones we've tested so far for out-of-box configurations. At 230 watts and 40 dBA, we measured a junction temperature approaching 92 degrees. The nearest competition is the Thick Ultra at 210 watts, which has plastic battlements minimizing the cooling performance. ASRock does okay with the 190 watt Silent V BIOS, and claiming second place isn't bad, though the price of $480 USD currently, that may change, but that's what we saw in retailers today, it does make it worse value than the Nitro Plus, the Pulse, the Gigabyte 5700 XT triple fan solution, and some of the other cards. Gigabyte had the largest delta of all the coolers tested between junction and edge, indicative of suboptimal mounting pressure, but the important number puts it at five degrees warmer than the Tai Chi X and a few tens of dollars cheaper. GDDR6 thermals are next, again isolating to just ASRock before expanding to include everyone. The 4V BIOS options have no bearing beyond the GPU power target. At least there's no difference when this fan speed is normalized or manually configured. The GDDR6 thermals remain almost perfectly locked within 0.7 degrees at 190 watts and 40 dBA or 0.9 degrees at 230 watts and 40 dBA. PRM MOSFET thermals are identical in each set of tests. Comparatively, the ASRock 5700 XT Tai Chi X ends up fourth down in the 40 dBA G6 thermal chart, ranking behind the Gigabyte 5700 XT's equally powered 190 watt vBIOS. The Sapphire Nitro Plus at 220 watts shows everyone up by being bested only by itself, hitting 73 degrees G6 at 220 watts and 68 degrees at 200 watts. Ultimately, though, all that matters is that we're below the G6 maximum safe temperature after accounting for a higher case temperature ambient. With most average to good cases measuring in the 30s, like 35 degrees Celsius or so, for internal ambience in our test environment, we want to keep GDDR6 thermals below about 90 degrees Celsius in open air. And if you have a hotter ambient environment, like you don't run AC or something, then that should be factored in as well. The Tai Chi X at 190 watts is still well below the spec for G6 and performing well, although bested by others. And the Tai Chi X at 230 watts is pushing what we're comfortable with when noise normalized. For the money paid, there are solutions that handle GDDR6 thermals better, but there's obviously more to it than that. Back to ASRock only briefly, the Tai Chi X with auto settings ends up roughly the same between the two sets of tests. The fan sits at roughly the same RPM, plus or minus 30, and the power budget is the same. The new OCV BIOS runs about two degrees cooler in junction and edge at 87 versus 89 or so, and the silent V BIOS has no meaningful change. We'll have to look at frequency differences later to see if there's a reason the OCV BIOS is manifesting a change or if it's just within the usual plus or minus one degree variance for the test environment and results. The comparative results for auto thermals start to illustrate where cards deviate. This isn't a chart of which cooler is best, mind you, just a chart of which cooler likely operates the loudest out of the box. The reason for normalized noise levels is that it allows us to see who actually made a better cooler than the competition, whereas the auto control charts just demonstrate who has a more aggressive fan curve. With this chart, the Tai Chi X chart tops as a result of the 1700 RPM fan against the 190 watt V BIOS. It's not bad, really, and the noise normalized charts did, to be fair, have it at 
a firm second place after the Nitro Plus when running at 190 watts, so this is a fair victory. It's less efficient than the Nitro Plus, which is running quieter in this chart, but it's still ahead of the rest of the pack. The Nitro Plus had a, a pretty weak auto fan curve, and this can be adjusted for by the user, and probably should be. The Thick Ultra, one of the two worst executed cards on the chart, alongside the Evoke, manages a second place finish with thanks to its similarly loud noise levels. Some of these cards, like the Thick, brute force their way to the top, but the Tai Chi X at 190 watts is only brute forcing its way past the Nitro Plus and otherwise holds its own. The Tai Chi X at 230 watts runs center pack for performance at 87 degrees junction. The fact that it gains rank versus the 40 dBA result is because the fan is running unapologetically at about 2100 RPM, or roughly 43 to 44 dBA. That puts it as louder than most other auto-configured solutions, aside from the XFX Thick, and so that should be taken into account if you're running auto. Back to ASRock only, the G6 thermals under auto conditions are completely acceptable. Fan speeds are running based on the default fan curve here, and we have no complaints or concerns about running anything except for within spec. This is all fine. Here's the comparative data for auto-operated G6 and VRM MOS temperatures. In this chart, the Nitro Plus ends up in the lead for GDDR6, with the Gigabyte Gaming OC's impressive G6 thermals carrying over to the auto charts from the 40 dBA charts. The Thick at 210 watts is next, thanks to its high fan RPM under auto, and the Tai Chi X at 190 watts follows that. The Tai Chi manages superior VRM MOS thermals to everyone else, although at this level of performance, the metric has no practical implications, and you shouldn't use this as a gauge of which one to buy. MOSFETs don't get better or worse at their job based on temperature, at least not until they're derating at the very, very high end of the scale, typically between 125 and 150 degrees Celsius. This metric is the least useful, but we're showing it just in case we ever find something where it does matter, and also to understand who's taking advantage of the cooling solutions the best. The G6 thermals are under control for everyone except the MSI Evoke, the Thick Ultra with the Ultra High V BIOS, and the Pulse with the Silent V BIOS. The Tai Chi X at 230 watts does fine at 82 degrees. We need to take the card apart to better understand its construction. The card is relatively simple to disassemble, using the four standard spring tension screws to retain the heatsink fan combination, then a few additional screws through the backplate and PCB to secure the right side of the heatsink. As a quick aside, we'd like to see ASRock get rid of the unenforceable warranty void if removed stickers, but that's a different discussion altogether. Anyway, when we took the cooler off, we noticed overall even thermal compound spread and a good contact patch for the GPU, but we also noticed that the cold plate had some thermal paste smeared along the edges. We suspect that the card may have been repasted at the line and not fully cleaned, or perhaps it was manually inspected and repasted for media sampling. Whatever the reason, the smeared compound on the cold plate has no bearing on performance, so it doesn't really matter that much at all. We just found it curious as we've not seen that recently. It was probably manually inspected and repasted, or maybe it was a pre-production difference. But either way, something small just to show attention to detail. The base plate is a simple flat aluminum plate that contacts the memory and covers the rest of the card. Performance overall was fine, but if ASRock wanted to squeak out some more GDDR6 cooling potential, they could try adding small fins or pin fins to the base plate. EVGA, though, has some sort of patent on the so-called pin fins, so we're not sure if ASRock would be able to work around that, but it's a potential avenue for improvement if it were ever needed. Perhaps on a higher-end card, if AMD makes a higher-end Navi, it might be worth looking into. The VRM is cooled with L-shaped fins and an aluminum contact plate, allowing full contact via thermal pads to the rest of the aluminum heat spreader. The imprints in all the thermal pads are so perfectly mirrored of the components that we can tell ASRock was able to achieve good pressure distribution across the components, Something further illustrated by the overall reasonably closed delta between edge and junction. All of them are fully contacting the thermal pads, so this is good. Some of the cards we've taken apart recently have only had weak impressions on the pads or no impression on some of the pads and poorly distributed contact. So ASRock has done better than some of its competitors here. The backside of the PCB also uses a thermal pad for the rear of the GPU socket and opposite side of the memory. This is something we always push for but rarely see. So we're happy to see ASRock utilizing its extra service area in the backplate for some cooling. GDDR6 is flip chip, so the silicon is closer to the PCB than it is to the top of the black module, which means that the rear of the PCB is a good place to try and pull temperature down another one to four degrees, depending on what you're working with. Finally, the heat pipes contacting the GPU area of the cold plate have nearly full coverage across three of the six millimeter heat pipes, 
with the others providing less effective support at the outer edges. Adrock has effectively maximized its heat pipe contact area with the GPU section of the cold plate, which is also something good to see. Our frequency analysis chart will look first at the four ASRock V BIOS options. The old OCV BIOS averaged 2022 megahertz over the entire 3D Mark Firestrike Extreme fixed frame render. The old Silent V BIOS averaged 1928.6 megahertz during the same test with its reduced power target and frequency allowing the lower fan RPMs. The new OCV BIOS averaged 2022.4 megahertz for the run, so there's no change here from the original. And the new Silent V BIOS averaged 1917 megahertz for uh, a brought down average frequency silent to silent by about 11 megahertz. This means the earlier difference we saw between the two V BIOSes when flashing was probably just test variance and error. Here's a zoomed in look at a frequency plot versus other cards. We're not gonna spend long on this one, but it provides a sense of scale. The reference card sat in the 1870 to 1890 megahertz range. The pulse ran marginally faster, but achieved equivalent gaming results. The thick OCV BIOS held between 1907 and 1930 MHz, and the MSI evokes at the highest, at about 1945 to 1964 MHz. MSI's evoke averaged 2% higher average FPS than the reference and pulse models, which performed equivalently in gaming scenarios. The ASRock Tai Chi X sits at about 2022 MHz, and so plots the highest stock clock out of everyone so far. This is because of that higher V BIOS power budget and more aggressive frequency and fan configuration. Keep in mind that this chart is zoomed in to exaggerate the differences and make them actually legible. Here's a look at the fan RPM versus GPU edge temperature data. This is only for the new V BIOS as the data is roughly the same. Edge temperature is what the fan curve will follow and the OCV BIOS has a temperature target set of 70 degrees. This means that the fans will ramp to try and maintain a 70 degree temperature. Hence again, why noise normalized testing is so important. Allowing it to run auto is okay, but the nature of auto is that it'll change behavior in hotter or cooler environments. Anyway, the OC fan RPM sits at about 2050 to 2070 RPM to maintain this 70 degree result in a 21 degree ambient environment. The silent VBIOS edge target is 67, resulting in an RPM of about 1700 or so for the fans. Noise levels are brought just below 40 dBA at 20 inches with this VBIOS. As usual, the hard spikes down are reporting errors and you should ignore those. Here's a plot of the noise levels against RPM. 40 dBA is achieved around the 1812 RPM mark with the average operating temperature for the OCV BIOS between 42 and 44 dBA, depending on how aggressively the fan is ramping at any given point in the test. The curve becomes disproportionately noisy toward the middle where a 2400 RPM entry starts generating some more buzz from the center fan. We should note also that the center fan didn't spin until we were at or above 30% PWM, as the 25% initial test at 1040 RPM only spun the outer two fans. So a short version of the review, $480 is not worth it for this card. The card doesn't really have anything wrong with it overall. It's fine. It does okay in performance. Its auto configuration isn't terrible. 40 dBA is in sort of competing territory with the Nitro, but Sapphire does win. So strictly between this and the Nitro, at present, we do have to go with the Nitro. There's a few instances where the Nitro might not get the choice, and one of those would be the height of the card. But if the Nitro isn't getting the choice, it's still not going to be this from a performance angle. There's other options like the Gaming OC from Gigabyte or the Pulse, also from Sapphire, that are just positioned in a way that makes more sense. This is simply too expensive at $480. Let's talk hypotheticals. If it comes down to 440 or 450, now it makes more sense. Now you're competing directly with the Nitro. And at that point, what you're choosing is basically going to be hinged upon two things. One, are you using it auto without any changes? If you are, then this does currently have a better auto profile setup than the Nitro, but that could change if Sapphire issues a VBIOS update. It's one of the easiest things to fix. And uh, the second thing you would hinge on is the looks, and that's something you'll have to decide the form factor is not too much of a decider here because they're they're not all that different. The Nitro is right here, and they're not too different in terms of height and the length of its. I mean, they, the Sapphire card's got a big cooler too. So, anyway, not particularly worth it. It's not bad. It doesn't do anything exceptionally poorly. It's simply okay. But simply okay isn't good enough when you're asking as much money as this card is. Uh, and it's it's way too close to the NVIDIA cards. Those would be a better choice once you're spending that much money. So gaming results, if you're wondering where those are, they're irrelevant. The difference is within 2 to 2.5% of reference. 
who cares? It's a wash. Uh, and then for overclocking, it equalizes everyone anyway to the silicon quality, to the memory quality, things like that. So unless you're putting it under LN2, the PCB is just not going to matter. And uh, that'll be it for this one. Thanks for watching. The ASRock Tai Chi X in summation is fine, but not justifiable at the price. And that'll be it for this one. You can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. I'll see you all next time.